this has been standing here for centuries. The premier work of man, perhaps, in the whole Western world. And it's without a signature. Shot. A celebration to God's glory and to the dignity of man. Well, all that's left, most artists seem to feel these days, is man. Naked. Poor. Forked radish. There aren't any celebrations. Ours, the scientists keep telling us, is a universe which is disposable. You know, it might be just this one anonymous glory. Of all things, this rich stone forest, this epic chant, this gaiety, this grand choiring shout of affirmation, which we choose when all our cities are dust, to stand intact, to mark where we have been to testify to what we had it in us to accomplish. You are listening to TMB DOS. They must be destroyed on sight. The following podcast may contain language and discussions of a frank and adult nature, and spoilers regarding the films discussed are always to be expected. Thank you for joining us. Now start the show, Dr. Rausch. They must be destroyed on sight. Welcome back. It is They Must Be Destroyed on Sight, episode 143, and I am your host, Lee. It's pretty, but is it art, Russell? I'm joined by my co-host, Daniel. I started at the top, and I've been working my way down ever since. Harper, how are you doing, sir? Uh, how do you think? Uh, how else do you think I got here, really? <laughs> yeah, this is on, this is on the uh, slow or maybe mm-hmm. rapid descent down. <laughs> And we are joined by our special guest who has been on the show before. We're pleased to have him back. Jack, for the past 17 minutes, I've been lying my head off. Graham, how are you doing, sir? Pretty good. Thank you. It's been a lot longer than that. I was I was convinced mine was going to be, it's art, but is it pretty? Yeah, but I, uh, I picked it for myself because I'm just that goddamn selfish. So. <laughs> I figured you'd have some reference for girl watching for me, but you know. Well, honestly, when those parts of the uh, movie came up, I wasn't listening to the dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we're we're going to be looking at what at one point was Orson Welles' last film, F for Fake, from 1974. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about what we've watched in the last little while, and uh, we'll go right to our guest, Jack. What have you been watching? Well, I'm I'm sorry to have to tell you that I went to see the new uh, uh, Wizard movie, you know, the the new J.K. Rowling movie uh, with uh, people with magic wands in it. I went to see that. I kind of went to see it in in the hope that it would suck as much as I was told that it would, and I'd I'd get a blog post out of it, and it did, and I did. So I won't... (laughs) Uh, I won't go into details about it. It's 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 a terrible film. It's not just sort of politically horrible the way just about everything J.K. Rowling comes out with these days is. It's it's a really bad movie. It's it's confusing. It's jumbled. It's boring. It's yeah. It's really bad. Uh, and if you want to know exactly how bad, I'm I think it's next Friday. I'm going to have a big long blog post ripping it to shreds. So uh, yeah, that was fun. I recently saw the. Um, it has just been released on DVD. I saw Rupert Everett's The Happy Prince which is a, a sort of long-term passion project of his. He wrote it, directed it, and starred in it. It's about the last days in the life of Oscar Wilde. I nearly said Orson Welles. And <laughs> um, it's it's a pretty good movie. There's I, I have some sort of criticisms of it. It's structured as sort of what's going on inside Wilde's head, his thoughts and memories and so on in the last few days of his life. And then it kind of cheats by stepping out of the frame of that and giving you scenes 
where he's not present and then, you know and then it continues a little bit after he's dead and that annoyed me a little bit no it's 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 a pretty good film it's it's beautifully made it's beautifully acted and i like it because it shows wild you know as as a more as a as a more rounded person than we usually get you know it shows him as definitely a man at that point in his life more sinned against than sinning you know a, a persecuted man a ruined man a victim very much but also you know it shows you his it shows you that he was a flawed person. He could be, you know, he could be narcissistic. He could be a bully. He could consume the people around him and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's ultimately very sympathetic, but it's also quite quite honest about the man. Uh, and I was I was quite impressed with it. Nice, Dan. Sure, I've got uh, just a couple of things for uh, Thanksgiving Day. We uh, went over to a, a couple of friends' house. They usually have a fairly eclectic Thanksgiving Day uh, marathons kind of going on, kind of casual. Let's just watch kind of bad movies. So I ended up getting to see Predators, um, mm. which is the uh, 2010 Adrian Brody attempt at a Predator reboot. Actual, you know, like was perfectly serviceable kind of sitting and preparing food and sitting with friends and, uh, you know, lustily admiring all the man flesh on uh, stage there, which was a nice experience. The film itself is very much in that kind of shitty B-movie vein. There's not really much going on beyond, uh, yeah, that was uh, definitely an hour and 40 minutes of movie. Like a lot of these movies, I do think uh, it, uh, it does suffer from, you know, I, I really like these things to be like 90 minutes long. Um, the real problem with that film is just, you know, we in the audience know going in that we're walking into a Predator movie. So we kind of get the premise, but the film spends an, roughly an hour getting the characters in the film to understand that that's what movie they're in. And that's always going to be a problem in terms of pacing because, like, by the time the characters in the film have caught up with where we, the audience, already were just knowing the trailer and going to see the thing, uh, half the movie's fucking done. So, anyway, that was cute, and uh, I will probably never, ever watch it again. One that I liked a little bit more, which was even more aggressively stupid, but in a probably intentional way, um, we also watched Machete, uh, mm-hmm. the original, which I had uh, also never seen, also from 2010. And uh, this one is, if you if you don't remember, it was kind of part of that uh, Grindhouse fake trailer yep. uh, kind of thing that happened. Certain shots from that trailer get reused in the film, although the film, you know, was kind of constructed uh, originally from that. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with this. There are moments in that film that I cackled out loud, uh, out loud at, and some of those were even intentional. I don't know. I... It, it, the issue with that kind of thing is just that it can't kind of play the material straight. It has to play at a certain level of ironic disconnect yeah. in order to sort of like make the material work for the sort of perceived audience. And I wish that they had just decided to like, let's just make this movie about a um, Mexican man who uh, gets double crossed, et cetera, et cetera, rather than, let's do the kind of big goofy comedy version, which it kind of turns into. So there's some tonal issue there. Um, probably the really fascinating thing is watching the, uh, cause Robert De Niro plays a Senator who's trying to get reelected and he's running like this overtly anti-immigrant uh, campaign and the broadly satirical campaign ads that he's running that we get shown in the film <laughs> actually just look like regular Republican ads yeah. these days. Um, in fact, in fact, it was even slightly undersold for what we're, uh, what we'd expect today. Yeah. That was an interesting experience. It's, it's amazing that, um, that well, film's I mean, politics, I, I just completely was, was on board with, yeah, just kill them all motherfucker. It's fine. These, we're good. These days, if, if the campaign ad isn't a, a guy with a huge sombrero, you know, and a gigantic, a uh, drooping black mustache sort of <laughs> looming over a white child with a with a knife you know i <laughs> it's 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 kind of uh, not even it's not going to pass muster is it yeah yeah you, you'd be a you'd be a progressive republican at that point wouldn't you yeah, yeah. that would be that that's the left leaning centrist you know yeah, those are the ones that's who, right, you know, yeah. That's the Olympia snow ad this, at this point. Yeah, no. Uh, no, I, I enjoyed the film. I'm definitely going to see the uh, second one at some point. But uh, yeah, it's oh. very very much of that time period, too. You know. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you, the second one's definitely diminishing returns, like big time. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm I, kind I, of surprised I never saw it originally. It just kind of mm-hmm. never kind of came up for me. It was never one where I'm like, oh, yeah, this is sitting in front of me. Let's watch it, you know, sort of, sort yeah. of uh, vibe. Yeah. I do like that though, uh, that film, although it, it does suffer from what all these uh, sort of uh, pseudo grindhouse recreations suffer from the fact that they don't actually really replicate what those movies were back in the day, because if they truly did, 
there'd just be long, boring stretches with nothing going on because most of those movies were that they had long, boring stretches of nothing going on. And then you'd have your moments every, you know, like 20 minutes of maybe some violence or nudity or something like that. But in the, in this day and age, if you want to make a movie, that's a quote unquote grind house recreation, you have to pack it wall to wall with action, nudity, violence, everything just to keep the audience watching basically. So, right. And so it can't help but become a, sort of a self parody by the end, even if they even if they play it as straight as possible, it, it still ends up being a wink at the audience at some point. So, well, and the I mean that one Machete also suffers from that same kind of problem, and that it's a little bit too long, and that it mm-hmm. we spend a lot of time with that you know kind of final gunfight sequence, which runs about thirty minutes of the film, I think, mm. and um, especially when you have that much kind of mayhem happening. It does get wearying on the on the uh, willingness to kind of keep watching it for a while. You know, that should have been like 15 minutes or like spread throughout the film a little bit more. I mean, it's hard to complain when like the whole point of a film like that is glorious excess. But <laughs> sometimes glorious excess just turns into, OK, I've had enough. It's fine. You know, yeah, you're not upsetting me. You're boring me. <laughs> that's that's kind of where I'm at. But. Mm-hmm. I'll just mention one thing I watched. Uh, I just watched it last night, actually. The new Coen Brothers film that's uh, on Netflix, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, Mm -hmm. which was originally supposed to be a six-part anthology series, but they basically edited it down into one two-hour movie with uh, the the six tales edited down, some extremely edited down. But it works as a movie. It's it's interesting. It's every tale sort of a meditation on death, and it doesn't go where you expect it to go. The, The Coens are... I think pretty well known at this point for sort of uh, dashing your expectations on the rocks as as far as uh, where a a plot is supposed to go in a movie. Sometimes it's just the grim reality of the old West where, yeah, you're going to die. There's no John Wayne coming to save your ass at the end or anything like that. And some of the tales are pretty good. Some are a little too brief and don't have a lot going on. The, The opening one is really exceptional. It's, it's, both both sort of uh, poetic and comedic. It's, it's got this like straight out of early Hollywood singing cowboy as its protagonist, which is interesting because he's thrown right into like Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it, there's a nice little uh, juxtaposition there between the two things. I really enjoyed some of the performances in this. Uh, Tom Waits has one tale centered around his character uh, playing a prospector, and I think he deserves an Oscar nod for his performance. I don't know if the Academy Awards have changed their mind on giving Oscar nods to Netflix films yet or not, but um, if they do, then it, it would be worth uh, looking at his performance for that. Really worth checking out. Two hours, but it goes by at a pretty good pace. It, it was never boring, and I uh, enjoyed it. Awesome. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. I'm yeah. going to have to check that out as well, definitely. Yeah. Tom Waits is a great actor. Mm-hmm. He's always uh, the best thing in anything he's in. It's almost like he, he plays an, he plays a crazy uh, gold prospector. He, it's almost like it's one of his songs come to life kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it's 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 pr- it's pretty special. If nothing else, see that segment uh, with with Tom Waits. It's really really good. Uh, all right, so we're gonna take a quick break, and then we're gonna come back, and we're going to talk about F for Fake. Badasses, Boobs, and Body Counts is a weekly podcast that discusses all things Grindhouse, Exploitation, Drive-In, and B-Movies. Your three hosts, Mike. We're, we're going to discuss the Rene Martinez-directed picture, the $6,000. What? Time, Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's the name of the Super movie. Bro. Soul that's, brother. That's the name. When you that's start the, the movie. DVD cover. When you start the movie, the first thing that comes up says. is the title, and it says $6,000. $6, Mark and I've been around a girl stroking a horse's dick. Somehow, somewhere down the line, I'm going to use that clip against you. Shh, do it. <laughs> please do. And listener favorite Iris. The deployment sock. And I'm like, deployment sock. What the fuck is a deployment sock? He goes, you know, you know that sock that you just use. Oh my god, you guys are so gross. I come my depl- <laughs> See, so it happens for real. People do come inside. We'll make you question your political correctness while laughing at theirs. Episodes drop Sunday and can be found by searching for BB and BC Podcast via iTunes, Lipson, Stitcher, Google Play Music, 
and everywhere else you can download quality podcasts from. You can also listen to episodes directly from the show's website at bbnbcpodcast.com. Mmm, great coffee. Mmm. Hey. Hmm? Chad, who's that strange, somber man on the cover of that book you're reading? Oh, that's H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, I've heard of him, but I never really got into his stuff. It's kind of strange and hard to read. No, I used to think that, too. But that all changed when I started listening to the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. What's that? The H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast is a weekly podcast. Tell me more. Well, these two really smart and hilarious guys give a synopsis of the story, then they talk about its background, the critical views, and what it says about the author. Well, where can I listen? Let me tell you, Chris, you can go to hppodcraft.com or, heck, just subscribe through iTunes. It's that easy. Oh, Chad, I'm so excited. Now I can listen to this podcast and pretend to all my snooty friends that I actually read and understand H.P. Lovecraft. Hey, that's what I do. H.P. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> Right, F for Fake from 1974. Ladies and gentlemen, by way of introduction, this is a film about trickery and fraud, about lies. We don't talk about Napoleon or Julius Caesar. We're talking about Elmir. Elmir? Elmir? Who is Elmir? That question has yet to be answered with any real precision. Can I kiss you too? Mm-hmm. Anybody wants to eat? In the world of the jet setters among us beautiful people, everybody knows Elmir. But Elmir what? He has about 60 times the same name. Dehori? He's called his name Ori, Uri, Bori, Suri, Kori, Bari, Dori, all the. Oh, papa. With U R Y, 60 names. His real name was Elmir Ferenc Hoffman. Then 60 personalities, as much lies and as much real. Well, <laughs> sounds very Jesuitic. <laughs> yes, his, his world is a world of make believe. I'm not an actor. Not an actor? Elmir. I'm not an actor. I am not a professional actor. He's a leading actor in this movie. His profession, it's true, is painting, painting fakes. Among all fakers, Elmir is number two. Once 
I saw a man from Ibiza writing a book on fake who came to see me to Paris. He said, I heard you are the first man who bought a, an Elmi. That man's name was... Clifford Irving. The important distinction to make when you're talking about the genuine quality of a painting is not so much whether it's a real painting or a fake. It's whether it's a good fake or a bad fake. Directed by Orson Welles, Gary Graver, Oha Kadar, and Francis Rickenbach. Written by Orson Welles and Oja, Oha, Oha Kadar. Again, I keep fucking that one up. Um, <laughs> it's Oya Kadar. It's Oya, Oya. Kadar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. Except uh, that's not her real name. No, <laughs> no it's not. <laughs> Although, um, yeah, I, I should have just reminded myself it's basically... Oh yeah, Kadar, basically. If, if you... Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Again, fittingly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, maybe that's what Orson Welles was thinking when he renamed her. He was—it was just a secret little joke. <laughs> Secretly, it's oh yeah, Kadar. <laughs> so anyway, she no definitely real... brings the life to my green penis. Is what I was thinking. <laughs> Uh, so this is sort of a pseudo documentary of sorts. So there's really no actual characters so much in this. Uh, it's basically just Orson Welles, uh, Elmer de Hore, who is a famous art forger, Clifford Irving, who uh, was a writer who later became famous for writing a fake uh, diary, basically of uh, Howard Hughes. Um, it's got uh, Oya uh Joseph Cotton, Francis Reichenbach, Richard Wilson, Paul Stort, Mark Forgey, just all kinds of cronies associated with Orson Welles for the most part sort of show up in, in little bits and pieces here. We do have a little synopsis here on IMDb from someone anonymous. So uh, good on you not uh, providing your name for us to laugh at you. Orson Welles' freeform documentary about fakery focuses on the notorious art forger, Elmer Deore. <laughs> Yeah, free form. <laughs> what, did, what, did, what did I tell you? It's, it's an IMDb. Yeah. I, do, you, do you actually do you actively pick bad ones for this, or do you just kind of pick the... I just the I generally just pick the first one, so yeah, I, don't, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't really read through I, them. I'm, I did, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I keep forgetting that I'm actually... That if I speak, you'll hear me, because I'm so used to just... <laughs> <the show. laughs> yeah, so a notorious art forger, uh, Elmer de Horry and a Clifford Irving who also wrote the celebrated fraudulent Howard Hughes autobiography, then touches on the reclusive Hughes and Wells' own career, which started with a fake resume and a phony Martian invasion. On the way, Wells plays a few tricks of his own on the audience. So, you know, not bad. It's kind of hard to pin down what's going on in this movie at any given time, though. And It's kind of like, describe, you know, describe the Mona Lisa. Well, there's this chick and she's sort of smiling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of thing. So we'll, we'll start with you, though, Jack. What, what are your sort of general uh, thoughts on this film? Okay, well, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. I think it's one of the one of the greatest movies ever made. It's one of Wells' masterpieces. I just love this. I just adore this. You know, I've been in love with this movie ever since I saw it for the first time. As uh, it just it just came on TV. Fun, funnily, I was sort of staying with relatives. Uh, not tremendously willingly. And, uh, you know, uh, there was, I was, I was very young. God, I think I was like 13 or something. And I was not oh. on the lookout for a art film from the seventies to watch, you know, <laughs> but I was on the lookout for something to do and it came on late night TV and yeah, I've just been in love with this movie ever since. That is such the ideal way to encounter this film for the first time. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So what are your sort of general thoughts, Dan? I, I mean, I, I pretty much completely agree with Jack. I think this is this this routinely ends up on my like top five, top ten favorite films ever made. It's uh, Wells' kind of misunderstood masterpiece. 
Uh, I think it, it completely, once you've seen this, I think you, you understand exactly kind of where he was going with the other side of the wind and what mm-hmm. the, his later career would have been had he been able to uh, keep making films. Kodar is amazing. Um, one of the things with uh, with seeing the other side of the wind, and I'm sorry, I know Jack, you haven't seen it yet, um, so I won't give details. But she, uh, she, what what I regret in the other side of the wind is that she is not allowed to show the personality she's allowed to show in this film. Mm. That uh, you know, I loved, I love her smile, I love her laugh, I love her eyes, I love just kind of everything that she has. To uh, you, you get a g- better sense of you know why Orson Welles was so infatuated with her on things other than just, you know, the physical, yeah. <laughs> although there's that too in, in this, than in the other side of the wind, I think it's glorious. The, the one thing for me is that I kind of knew the, uh, the gag going into it. I saw Citizen Kane when I was like, I think the summer of my, when I was 18, like after high school, before college, you know, in some like English comp class early on, I had to, in college, we were uh, writing, you had to write some like research paper and I, and I did like a, like a Wells biography sort of thing. And so I read a couple of Wells's, like the official Wells biography, I think Citizen Wells I read, and it like included a big chunk about this film. And uh, I just like, it just sounded bizarre. <laughs> well, I've got to fucking see this thing. And so I uh, checked it out back when, you know, I think Blockbuster or something had it. And so I, I kind of like put it on that way. I do not remember the details of my first viewing, but I remember just all the description of, you know, the kind of meta text of it that I read in the book and the, in the biography was true. And yet this, it blew everything that I thought it could be away. It was so much better than even the sort of like fawning version I read in the biography. <laughs> and I've, I've been, I've been amazed at this film ever since I own the criterion disc. Uh, so that should tell you how much, how much I enjoy this. Nice. Yeah. So this is a first time watch for me. I actually just watched it tonight before we came on for the podcast And man, I think this is going to be on my best of list for this year. Uh, I think it's going to break the top 10, definitely. At the same time, I need to watch it like three or four more times just so I can sort of pick up (laughs) what's what's going on. Because early on this film, for the first hour where he does not lie to you at all, everything is is based uh, on true facts. It's very much like The Other Side of the Wind, where it's blitzing you with all these quick cuts back and forth between people. Sometimes you see people finishing on the people's sentences, and, and it focuses in on a, as, a, as a documentary about these two, basically, uh, <laughs> these two con men. One, one's an art forger, a fucking brilliant art forger, and one would uh, later forge a fake autobiography. So, And he's being, I, I guess he was writing the biography of Elmer de Hore at the, at the time, or or he had written it before the film was uh, was made. They're both living on, uh, was it uh, Ibiza? On Ibiza, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they're both just living in this small little island uh, town, and <laughs> they're just hanging out in parties, and they're just having this, these discussions about what is art and uh, what what good are, are art critics. And if you d- if you didn't have forgers, what what good would art critics be? You know, experts on. Uh, on, on what is real art and, and, and what's a what's a fraud. A lot of that stuff, I will fully admit, just sort of went over my head in this first watch. So that's why I want to go back to it and sort of pick up on the conversation a little bit more. But yeah, it starts off with that, and that's really unique. And then it gets into <laughs> almost it almost goes um, noirish in a way because you have Wells walking around as sort of both uh, breaking the fourth wall narration. Uh, and as sort of a, a character in the movie as well, where he's, he's walking around in a big fucking black uh, cape and, uh, <laughs> and hat. And, and it's like, what the hell's going on here? He's, he's dressed up as like a magi- magician or something like that. And that's, oh, yeah. that's kind of Wells's late life persona. <laughs> <you> know, that's, <laughs> that's well, he, that's he like, would just, he would just walk into parties dressed like that. Yeah. Like that's just, yeah. you know, that's just the, awesome playing the character Orson Wells. But uh, it's, it's interesting. So he, he's he's playing magic tricks for kids, and then he's just he's just talking about fakery, and he gives us this story about uh, a master faker who uh, turns out to be uh, Oha's uh, grandfather, and apparently, uh, the, 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 as the story goes, uh, she had Picasso paint twenty two uh, nudes of her, and then she took them all and <laughs> and sold them, uh, in in or put them in an uh, art gallery uh, anyway. Then this is basically. Picasso learns of this and then goes trudging off to France to confront her and, and her uh, grandfather and discovers that her grandfather burnt all the originals and now only the fakes have survived. But that turns out to totally be a lie. I did kind of suspect that he was going to 
try something in this film, like, you know, try to flip it on the audience a little bit, but I didn't quite realize to the extent that he would do it. So um, I was pleasantly surprised by the end of the film, uh, his little story. But yeah, my general impressions starting off, I love this a lot. And it's going to require some uh, more viewings, I think. But uh, it is on my best of list for, for this year. Great. I think my experience of watching this the first time as as like a thirteen year old in the nineteen nineties is a, a bit diff- different to what uh, to, to how most people in the, in the seventies would have experienced it because at that time to- at that time I you know I'd not only never heard of uh, Elmer de Jorge I I'd, I'd never heard of Clifford Irving I'd sort of faintly heard of Howard Hughes but I didn't know it so I I remember watching it the first time you get to that point where he starts spinning the tall tale about Oya and Picasso and all that. And it wasn't so much that I, I mean, I was watching it and I wasn't swallowing it necessarily, but it wasn't that I was sitting there thinking, is this real? I, I just cool. didn't know if any of it was real. I didn't know if the guys in the first hour of the movie were real people. You know, right. I, yeah. I, I had no idea how much of any of it was actually real. That's not. That's probably not the way it was intended to work, but the, it, it worked yeah, on an entirely different level with me. It, it's very kind of rewatching it now, and I haven't seen it in a number of years, um, just because I just never again sat down and, and put it on. I deliberately watch it very seldom, so as not to lessen the effect when I watch it. You know. Oh yeah, um, I rewatched it twice this week. I watched it once right after Lee and I finished recording for the other side of the wind. I went, oh, let me put on fifteen minutes of effort fake before bed, and then I watched the whole damn movie. And then I rewatched it this afternoon before <laughs> recording, <laughs> which tells you, you know, how how amazing that is. Yeah, I'll kind of get back to that uh, kind of later on, I think. But what what I find astonishing is the audience in 73 would have been expected to know who DeHore and who Clifford Irving and you know, kind of all these figures are. And I think yeah. we kind of watching it now, I mean, I, I still really, I mean, I, you know, now that I can look all these people up on Wikipedia, I can go, oh, okay. So I kind of know this was, this was all like very much in the news at the time, but you know, we're now, almost 50 years so what year or what 45 years from then all this stuff is very much uh you know it was news of the day and is now you know kind of just i you know i've never heard any of these people mentioned except for in this film quite honestly (laughs) i mean obviously howard hughes i know who howard hughes is and you know uh but uh, but like Irving and uh, Dehori, and so they might as well be fake characters but the the way that i understand the way that, that this film happened was Irving was interviewing Dehore for what was supposed to be just kind of a fairly straightforward like documentary about Dehore, which was directed by Reichenbach. And then they ran into some kinds of issues and Orson Welles was kind of hired on just to sort of, you know, almost as like director for hire to, to come on and like make this footage into something. And once he started playing with the footage, suddenly he goes in and he starts shooting his own stuff with Reichenbach with some of the other people in the film. And so he just sort of transforms the project from what would have been a very straightforward, almost boring middle of the road, you know, like a TV documentary effectively into this, you know, into this much more interesting metatextual like examination of the art of making these kinds of documentaries in a way. Um, And I, and what I find is, you know, so, so when I, when I view this, I view this as sort of like, almost like if you took some boring history channel documentary that was, you know, about some bank robber or something. Then you kind of gave that to like David Lynch to just completely (laughs) rework or something. You know, that's sort of how I envision the bizarre kind of history of this and why this is this kind of weird thing. And in 73, nobody seems to have really understood what this was. Yeah, I, I think people just kind of, watched it baffled and then just kind of walked out and went, well, that was certainly Orson Welles' latest movie. Good job, Orson, <laughs> you know, like, you know, but yeah. now, and then I, I mean, I'll just kind of throw this in now. I know uh, Jack, you were kind of tweeting about it. This feels, I, so I rewatched this the first time right after uh, I got done talking with Lee over after Out of the Side of the Wind. I watched it on YouTube and the beauty of that is, damn, does this fucking feel like a YouTube video? Yeah. And I mean that in the best possible way. Like this feels like the greatest YouTube video yeah. uh, today. Um, 
there are so many like kind of great like left leaning or leftist uh, YouTubers who are making essentially like this kind of idea, this kind of narrative essay, this kind of video film essay. It just kind of reiterates this idea that I that I've kind of had in the last couple of episodes where we've talked about this. Where you know, if Wells if Wells were living today, he would be the greatest of the YouTubers. Essentially, that that's that's his great talent, <laughs> and um, and and that's in no way to denigrate Wells's talent. That's to say he's you know 50 years ahead of his time essentially so i'll stop talking now because i've i know i've um i could gush about this film all fucking day yeah no i i i totally agree i think what i think from what i can work out the sequence of events is that it's while wells is editing together reichenbach's footage about elmia and irving sort of as a talking head that the news breaks that irving faked the hughes autobiography Right, and right, that's, right. That's, yeah, sorry, that's, that's the detail what, I forgot to include. Yes, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, that's what sort of triggers the. Uh, but I, I love what you said about it being like a history documentary, where they, you know, like if if they if somebody's editing together a, a a bog standard History Channel documentary about, I don't know. Um, I'm obviously the the times are all wrong, but the, you know about Hitler, you know, and then uh, one of the talking heads you used is the guy that faked the diaries, and the news comes out that he faked the diaries as you're editing it together, and then you give it to David Lynch, and he makes, you know, yeah, it's it's like that. What what I love is that uh, I mean, uh, Wells even has a line in the film where suddenly, like, and then we looked at our old footage like a time machine. Who knew what when? When was this shot? They don't, and this is this the interesting thing for me is that they don't kind of go in and do a straightforward you know sort of like okay let's look at what was said what can we actually know about these things the wells his artistic oh, no, genius he, is to transform it into a question about what does what does what does forgery even mean and yeah. he's context, aren't, we, aren't we all committing forgery just detail. by cutting footage right you know so yeah sorry go ahead like, any other filmmaker would would take this opportunity to to do like investigative reporting or detective work wells is like aggressively uninterested he's not the slightest bit interested in trying to track down which painting in which gallery is actually by yeah. elmir or you know exactly when irving got the idea to fake the hughes book he, he raises the possibility that the fake hughes signature is by elmir w- wonderfully by by showing us film of Elmir faking Orson Welles' signature on one of his cameras. <laughs> right. But that's, that's as far as he goes anywhere near any sort of detective work. He just doesn't care. He's got completely other fish to fry. <laughs> but one of my favorite little bits like that is when, uh, he, when uh, he says maybe Clifford's book about Elmir being a fake was actually a fake and Elmir is actually a real artist. <laughs> you know? yeah. And Elmir yeah. is someone faking being a being a fake artist for the money he gets for being a part of the and yeah, I well, mean they, it's well, there there and there's something very modern about that too where you know we all kind of live online. We have this sort of like we, we all have kind of the persona we present to the world versus the persona that we kind of mm. already live, you know, this idea of sort of like understanding these kind of nested layers of irony that just sort of come up on like Twitter, like Twitter jokes are so often sort of like um, built around, like this was this particular subculture that happened on this particular day. And if you like take one thing out of context, it makes no sense, but you can make it mean something completely differently. And then that gets used by nefarious actors all over the place. And it, it yeah, it just strikes me as very, Again, very, very 21st century. I, I wanted to shove this it's, in the faces of like so many people. You know? Yeah, it's so ahead of its time. It, it, it's incredibly ahead. I mean, it's no wonder that nobody in 1974 knew what the fuck to do with it because it's it, it's so. I mean, just just in terms of form, the editing is so far ahead of its time. I mean, watching it again, I, I was thinking, you know, this is. You know, Oliver Stone, when he did JFK, everybody said gave him all the plaudits for this amazing editing job. It's it's already been done. Look, here it is. Orson yeah. Welles already did it. Different made... film stocks jostling for position. And oh, uh, if 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 Other Side of the Wind had been re- had been actually produced and made and released in the mid seventies, JFK would have been the like footnote. Uh, honestly, oh, I know you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. yet, wouldn't JFK have benefited from something of this film's? awareness of you know the, the possibilities of of uh, falsification and falsified history and layers of lying and and people oh, pretending no, absolutely. To, be, to be who absolutely. they who they're not it, watching J, thinking about jfk after watching f for fake uh it's it's interesting that there's 
F featuring in both titles. It's like JFK is almost like somebody doing F for fake again, but completely missing the point and right. thinking, yeah, what if Elmia was this big for you? <laughs> and what if Howard Hughes was up there doing all sorts of things and completely missing the point, but sort well, of doing, trying to do the same thing again? Yeah, Elmer de Hore, I was reading his Wikipedia page just to see some background on this guy, and apparently even his his entire life seems to be, there's some uh, doubt here and there of some of the stories yeah. he's told of himself. And this movie, first thing I thought about that would pair really well in a double billing with this, even though it's it's much more of a straight sort of documentary film, An, an Honest Liar with James Randi. I, I, yeah. I kind of feel like mm-hmm. it sort of has that same idea where the, uh, the original topic becomes less interesting and it falls into a totally different story that sort of changes the whole thing by the end of it. It's not as interesting and inventive as F for Fake ends up being, but uh, it has sort of has sort of the same vibe where the whole world, the way you think things are going, it sort of gets turned on its head uh, by the end of it when you learn some facts about James Randi that <laughs> sort of sort of fall on his lap. And of yeah, course, there's a... the uh, there's the magic connection there as well. Sorry, mm-hmm. Jake, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was I was going to say that as well. Yeah, well, no, well, of course, as a conjurer, his entire life is one of his his lifelong passions. Yeah. Um, also, I would just say that art forgery makes for a good story anyway, even if, you, if you're presenting it uh, as fiction. And I'd say um, this would also be a decent pairing with uh, the Win Winders film, uh, The American Friend. I don't know if either of you have seen that one. It, it was based on one of the uh, Thomas Ripley novels. Uh, oh, I have not seen that. Yeah, no, was, I don't think I have. It's, I don't it's, it's, yeah, Dennis Dennis Hopper is uh, Tom Ripley. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put Tom that, let's put that on the fucking by, list then, you know. <laughs> Tom Ripley has been played by such an incredibly diverse li- list of actors. Yeah. I think it was yeah. Dennis Hopper, John Malkovich, Matt Damon. <laughs> how, many, mm-hmm. how many fictional characters can be played by that list of people? <laughs> Ellen Delon uh, played them, uh, and yeah. I think I think the very first adaptation of of one of those books. You know who make a great Ripley? Kate Blanchett. I say I say let's completely recast. Let's go. That works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I'd say uh, the American Friends a good pairing too because that that turns into like a neo noir that uh leaves out all the parts that make sense uh <laughs> on, on what's going on but it but it's like a intentional kind of thing by the director and um, well if as long as we're talking vendors we could do um wings of desire which kind of is uh, both this sort of philosophical meditation which there's a particular sequence one of the most famous sequences in effort fake is the uh wells contemplation of uh Chatra but also becomes deeply metatextual when Peter Falk shows up playing himself in the uh, final himself. third, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a wonderful, it's funny. I was thinking about things to, to pair it with. And I, I came up with um, the, the doctor who story, a city of death, which is the one where they, uh, <laughs> they have loads of faked Mona Lisa's and John Burge's uh, 1970s television series, ways of seeing. I, I totally agree with what you were saying, Daniel, about this being like a proto YouTube video, you know, in the best way of this, uh, of these amazing. So some people on YouTube, I don't equate them to F for fake necessarily, but some people have created amazing discursive video essays using that form, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting to me that it's taken outsiders you know, creating gonzo art, so to speak, to catch up with Wells, whereas really barely anybody else has in the interim. But Wells could have, you know, I think it's one of the great tragedies that nobody working in TV sort of saw this and contacted Wells, you know, because they, they, there were some wonderful television documentaries in the 70s. And when you look at the the complexity of filmmaking that went into, and the money and the went into, and the sort of auteurish control that went into series like Bronowski's Ascent of Man and uh, series like that. It's, it's it's such a shame that somebody at the BBC didn't call Wells up and say, "Look, we, we just have some money and make television films for us." Yeah, you know, uh, you know I, what, you know what Wells would have got offered in the 1970s. He would have got offered like a, a new, a new uh, iteration of Night Gallery or something, and just be the host of that, you know, and just kind of waste. Yeah, they his would time. have wanted him sat there in a bow tie, telling charming anecdotes, mm-hmm. which would have been awesome, but not in the same way. No, no, I, no. I saw, I saw you tweeting about like TV, and I, and for some reason, I, I hit the uh, Connections TV series with James yeah, Burke. Yeah which is uh, also sort of composed on kind of a shoestring budget, kind of looking at these 
you know, very big picture kind of ideas about, you know, how civilizations are constructed and, you know, this kind of interplay between science and, and art and history and religion and, you know, uh, culture and, uh, you know, again, very different kind of concept, but I can imagine Wells kind of working well in that kind of genre, kind of being yeah. a, a similar kind of thing. I mean, I would love to have had, you know, a, a you know, a 10 part BBC series made in 1978, which is, you know, Orson Wells doing this, you know, for 10 yeah. hours. It would be yeah. amazing. Well, you look at some of those classic documentary series, you know, you've got Lord Clark's Civilization, you've got Alistair Cook's America, you've got particularly, I would say, Bronowski's Ascent of Man. They're, they're lavish, they're incredibly discursive and risk taking, and they're very, very authored. So it, it, it's in many ways, it's kind of at that point in his career, it's almost like the perfect. With obviously, if it's going to be on television on the BBC, you know, he's going to have to accept certain limitations. Sure. But, um, you like mean he perfect... can't have extended sequences of his uh girlfriend his naked? Ass. Yeah, no, <laughs> she probably she probably could have been naked if if there was like uh wackety sax playing in the background and she was sped I... up. Back then, you could have done though that you know that people were more broad minded back then, ironically enough, if there Ooh. was a justification for it, you know. The well, BBC I mean, would have let Oya, him do that. Oya Kodar's ass is kind of justification in itself. Justification in itself, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she would have been in all the carry-on films. She's a good actress, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh. in scenes she, she's where... amazing in this. I do think that, you know, she she apparently claims that sort of the opening sequence, the girl-watching sequence, and then that sort of last, that sort of like the big fake thing at the end where, where her idea that she kind of gets she should be credited as a little bit more of a co-director or a kind of a co-creative voice in this and i i have no reason to doubt that honestly i've read sort of alternative um accounts of this but by some she she says that the whole riff in the last half hour is about uh, you know her affair with picasso and all that stuff that's her story essentially that's wells working from her story and that seems to definitely be true i think and she claims that <laughs> i wonder i wonder if in the real version wells was the picasso figure <laughs> well <laughs> he, yeah i mean he, he kind of is subtextually isn't he right right um, um, well, i mean but, yeah, the, um, the camera almost when the story's being told uh, it's supposed to be from picasso's perspective looking through his blinders like a peeping tom yeah, uh, and uh, which shows a healthy degree of self awareness, I think. On oh, yeah. we, we spoke about that on uh, the the past episode. Uh, Other side of the wind is also pretty uh, pretty much Wells opening up about all of his faults. <laughs> yeah, but I think she claims to have actually directed or partly directed the opening sequence in Rome with her walking through the streets and getting men to ogle her, and she uh, conceived that from a, a feminist perspective. Um, yeah, which is sure. interesting because you know it's difficult to watching it these days there is a certain level of discomfort i would say i mean apart from it's, it's obviously not an unpleasant thing to watch uh, or your coda walking uh, along the streets but you know, it, it there is it, with all these guys staring at her and stuff like that but it's it's difficult to pin down your discomfort because i think there is there's a huge amount of uh, uh, of uh, criticism and interrogation there isn't there uh, of what these of the way she's being leered at by all these guys on the streets. And when you, when you think about it like that way, I, one of the things about this film, I mean, you know, Wells famously has a gigantic ego, which yeah. is largely deserved. I mean, let's not, let's not, you know, mince words about that, but um, it is amazing that a film like this, which is so good, which is so clearly authored quote unquote by Wells is also this hugely collaborative work. And that mm. is, he does have, you know, Reichenbach as a co-director and not just because Reichenbach shot all the kind of original footage and Kodar is clearly, regardless of whether she actually sort of directed certain sequences or not, um, is clearly very much involved in the creative process. Um, and that does uh, follow over into the other side of the wind where like clearly there is, there is this idea that there are kind of other people speaking with Wells. And even in his early days, you know, Greg Toland did the, uh, did the cinematography for, um, citizen kane and is uh if anything equally credited even by wells for you know the kind of the look and for the genius that is that film so i i do i do think that wells has a huge ego but he's perfectly willing to kind of sort of share the credit where the where that's due right you know wells is interesting because there are moments in his career where he's pretty unscrupulous you know he, he i mean after the after the sensation of the war of the worlds thing 
you know, Howard Cock barely gets a look in. You know, he, Wells doesn't say, well, it was Howard that wrote it. You know, he Wells sort of does this complicated thing where he, you know, in the press conference afterwards, he pretends to be shocked and appalled and regretful while obviously being pleased as punch. And then through the rest of his career, including in this film, he does this thing where he sort of kind of pretends that he knew that the, the War of the Worlds broadcast was going to have that effect and that he wanted it to happen and he was planning it, where, of course, he didn't at all. <laughs> no, not at all. Accident. They didn't even know <laughs> hold it was on, happening hold on. until... Are you, are you saying um, there might be some degree of obfuscation and lying in terms of, like, Wells's participation in the War of the Worlds in this film? I, well, the, yeah, I don't believe I, you. No, I, I think... <laughs> well, yeah. I, it, sounds, it sounds like you know that the uh, audio we hear is not actually from the original Mercury Theatre broadcast. No. It's a complete mock-up it's not even a new version of the script it's just completely new material yeah um yeah he he does he does do things like that sometimes wells and there are times where you you find him doing stuff like that and you want to say you bastard but he's certainly by this point in his life he's much more open to acknowledging the collaborative process of art i mean that's kind of what this film's about isn't it It, Mm. it's about undermining the whole concept of authorship as kind of this sacred unquestionable singular thing and yeah well, it's and, and it's and almost yeah, like spending is, spending 20 years you know bumbling around europe begging people for money maybe might have like humbled yeah, him yeah. just a little bit you think there's this weird paradox where you get to this stage in his career this is like this is the late stage of wells's career where he's he's now making completely independent films where he has total creative control because that's what he wants uh, uh apart from uh in in uh, contrast to almost every other part of his career, he, he now has complete creative control. And so these films have an, an intensely personal authorship, these late period films, and they are the best films of his career. Personally, I think the last four or five feature films he made are his greatest movies, in my opinion. But, and, and you know, and that's not a coincidence that there is... And there is a degree to which you give Wells that level of control and creative mastery over the project and his authorship of it creates these, this series of masterpieces. And yet these films, because as you say, he has to struggle to get them made. He has to work in this great big collaborative process. They're incredibly collaborative movies. And this is kind of his great sly winking acknowledgement of that, isn't it? This film, I think. Yeah. uh, That and the other side of the wind, both kind of, draw from that same uh source i think i mean the other side of the wind is so fucking collaborative that it's insane but uh especially just because he had to make it with different people over a period of many many years it's just you you can't help but acknowledge all the other voices involved in it the thing about being a a raging narcissist as he undoubtedly was Uh is that he's he's fascinated by himself and he's also a uh, he's also a very intelligent man, and he's he's very interested in truth because I think truth is is absolutely Wells's guiding passion. That's what his entire artistic career is about: trying to tell truth, trying to get at truth. Yeah. So while he's incredibly narcissistic and self obsessed, he has those two other redeeming qualities: that great intelligence and that great passion for truth. So he's he's sort of staring at himself all the time, but he's he's seeing what's really there, and then he's being honest about it. It's that's that's an incredibly appealing persona. I would Is, say. Isn't there some sort of? Uh, I believe there was some line in the film about forgers, in some regard, will help illuminate the truth, uh, even in their with their lies. Well, there's there's a sense of that. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, this gives me an excuse to kind of dig into like like the art world. One of the things that's kind of stated is that you know the reason all of this like kind of art forgery matters is that there are people. There's a market. There's there money is changing hands, and that a, a convincing fake can be worth you know tens of thousands of dollars. And the film doesn't examine why is that so, but the reason is because like really wealthy people use this as a store of value, and like the reason that these things are valuable is because you know, somebody, you know, somebody is inflating that monetary value due to some sense of artistic value, but that artistic value has to sort of be connected to this uh, sort of wisp of authenticity that some person, that some individual person that we can identify has to have made these lines in order to like justify sort of the prices of these things, you know, the prices that are paid for these things. So, That's why you kind of need to watch this in conjunction with ways of seeing, because John Burgess says, you know, the, these things 
suddenly the original has value because it is the original of a load of copies. It, yeah, yeah. Stephen Jay Gould. I haven't seen Ways of Seeing. That's something I've been meaning to to watch for for some time since you mentioned it to me, Jack. I'm reminded also of a, there's a Stephen Jay Gould essay where he uh, talks about authenticity in terms of he got to touch some objects that Charles Darwin once held, or he got to like uh, one of the tortoises that Darwin collected from the Galapagos Islands. He got to you know kind of be with that tortoise and touch it and say, I've, you know, my Darwin number is one or two because I've touched something that, that Darwin touched. And, uh, you know, why, why does that matter to us as a, as a sort of psychological phenomenon? I mean, which, sorry, I brought that up, but I'm, I'm, you know, you know, I kind of extend that further. Like it doesn't matter that, you know, Dehori's Picasso's look as good as any Picasso. I'm not going to kind of judge that one way or the other. I'm assuming that, you know, 99% of people, 99% plus worth of people, even the quote unquote experts can't tell the difference. They are as beautiful as any Picasso. And yet if their origin was known, they'd be worth less precisely because of this kind of concept of rarity inflates, you know, perceived value. And if suddenly everybody could have one, it's, it's, uh, no less beautiful, and yet the value of it plummets because of the way that this kind of art is used as a way of just kind of moving money around effectively. And yeah. I think that that's, that's, that that's one of the things that's not explicitly built into the film, but I think that's definitely something that the film is touching on, and that is the, the existence of this art market kind of makes this both possible and makes it inevitable, but also absent that kind of market we would ultimately have better art <laughs> like we would live with better art because you know it would it would not be as as uh, valued in that same kind of way he yeah. Uh, yeah he doesn't he doesn't go there exactly does he but he's definitely interested i mean the, the film is very concerned with the idea that art exists in this tortured relationship with commerce where you know it's both <clears throat> the work of the artist is both kind of deformed and devalued by the fact that it's commerce uh, commercial and at the same time the commercial value sort of stimulates its existence in the first place and the fact that you need these people to arbitrate as it were the relationship between what the artist does and its reason to exist in the world we have you know that the commercial world and those people those experts uh, the critics you know, and you can, uh, it, it's very easy to see why issues like that are of concern to Wells, you know, um, the relationship between artistic creation and money and Ugh. how the how the business side of it dominates the artistic side of it and how the people in the middle really with an incredible amount of, and, and this film is, it's not the slightest bit af afraid to say that their power is kind of just completely unearned you know they have feet of clay these people in the middle arbitrating this that the, the critics the experts who have basically you know barely a leg to stand on if any yeah he, he said something um i think it's de horror uh, himself says that most experts uh, are just superficial mm -hmm. experts they, they don't have any real expertise or really any appreciation they're just self-styled experts and Irving tells the anecdote about taking Mogdiliani's from one gallery to another and one saying, oh, and he tells the, the guy in one gallery, this is a fake. And the guy says, oh, yes, you can see because X, Y, and Z. And then he tells the guy in the next gallery, this is real. And the guy says, oh, yes, you can tell because X, Y, and Z. And then there's another layer of irony to that, of course, because this is Irving talking. So yeah. that story could be a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> I mean, I mean, ultimately, anything in this film could be a bunch of bullshit. I mean, and, yeah. and even the the way that like the magic tricks are shot, you know, Wells is drawing your attention to the fact that yes, I'm shooting a magic trick, and that way may, means that you're assuming that I am doing this in sort of real time to kind of a real person, and that this is sort of a real trick that I'm doing physically. And yet, the fact that it's on film and the fact that there are edits involved means that I could be faking this with a paid participant, you know, who's just pretending to be fooled, you know, like everything in this film is ultimately up to grabs. Even, you know, Wells is deliberately manipulating footage that is clearly shot in at different times and in different days and different, you know, kind of camera angles, but he's using it as a, a you know, to pretend like two characters are having a conversation. Right. He does this, uh, two or three times my, in the film. Yeah. One of my absolutely favorite sequences in the entire film is when he intercuts pregnant silences 
yeah. uh, from from two completely separate interviews, one with Irving and one with Elmia, and intercuts them so that it looks like you know these two guys are both silently pondering stroke evading the question yeah it, it's it's so clever it's so clever but but again as i as i have mentioned at least three or four times on this podcast you know wells you know he started his film career he took the negative or the he took the film stagecoach and yeah. re-edited it a bunch of times and he taught himself how to make films by editing stagecoach editing was always wells's passion yeah, yeah i think that, that was always the point of the process that he loved the most sitting there with with all of it at his fingertips and and the moviola you know and and cutting it he, well, they spent it, a it, year cutting this movie he, he and two collaborators both of them women and actually um they spent a year cutting this film editing is the it's it's people think you know like like sort of the the naive thing is like oh editing is taking stuff out no editing is putting together editing is making the thing out of the bits and pieces that you have put that you've assembled that you've like made previously but it, particularly in terms of a film editing is the process of like this is how we actually tell the thing that we're actually going to tell and I, and i think yeah. it's amazing that that's where that Wells, who was an actor before this, who had you know had this experience on the stage, who had had this experience uh, in radio, um, kind of like his his first experience with film was not you know kind of with cameramen or with you know actors or anything. It was completely he sat with a brilliant film and made a bunch of different movies out of it, and then learned how to make movies that way. It's uh, this. There's no better example of like where that leads than Effer Fick because it's completely just constructed out of. He's just making stuff out of this pre-existing thing, and yeah. then and then shooting little like inserts uh, effectively, you know, to 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 build this like brilliant piece of work. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just so in love with this film. Again, <laughs> I could gush about it all day but long. It's, it's always it's it was always Wells's genius, and I think he was a genius if that word means anything. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Just to throw in, just to throw in, Citizen Wells is very much about like the central thesis of that is that uh, Wells is sort of breaking that fourth wall, involving the audience, and sort of making people question the sort of the the boundaries of the art and the artist and the audience and you know the scene and the seeing the scene the seers and the scene was fundamental to like Wells's art from the beginning, even to his uh, days on the stage so sorry go ahead jack i very much agree with that and the editing is is actually the point about editing is key to that because wells is genius is all is all to do with editing in a sense it's all to do with shaping material that's already there i mean he he, he has a, a great deal of creative input into the the scripts and, and 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 stuff like that but he is a deeply for all that he's kind of the ultimate cinema auteur the ultimate cinema genius this is the image we have of him and the image that he sort of had this tortured relationship with because it kind of flattered and irritated his ego and the image that he played and then deconstructs in this movie for all that he is that he is a deeply collaborative filmmaker you know citizen kane is is the vision first and foremost of uh, mankowitz you know it, it's mm. the story that he really wanted to write and then wells takes it and shapes it and filters it through himself and that's what he's doing with with f for fake he's taking somebody else's documentary about somebody else's book about somebody else's life uh, and then his partner's stories about herself tall stories about herself and how she's seen by men etc cetera, etc cetera. and then he's adding his own uh, collaboratively adding his own feelings about himself and his own career and he's shaping that into this wonderful it's it's so for su- so for something that's so made of so many different pieces and so fast paced it's so incredibly cogent it's miraculous but the point the point i wanted to get to was that it's always about editing if you listen to the mercury theater radio adaptations what he does is he takes like the the one about dracula which i'm probably going to be writing about at some point in the future he he cuts it right down to the core elements and he shapes them into something new that's incredibly fluent and cogent and direct and that seems to be it's what he does with his shakespeare productions he cuts huge amounts of the text but he gives you something that he shaped from the the original source material. He turns Julius Caesar into this thing about uh, the rise of fascism back when that was a you know a, a relevant and new thing to be doing. And um, there, there's a on. line, there's a there's a story that somebody tells about uh, Wells. This is one of those anecdotes. I forget exactly who it was, but uh, somebody asked him, uh, "Oh, what are you working on?" And he says, 
oh, I'm making a Shakespeare adaptation, and then like deadpan, oh, uh, when are you going to finish writing the script? <laughs> <laughs> but part of it is this wonderful uh, lack of reverence that he has for the source material as well. He's, I love all his Shakespeare films, and Chimes at Midnight is not only my favorite Wells film, but it's one of my favorite, again, one of my favorite films of all time. But it's all his Shakespeare films are very they're obviously in love with the source material, but they don't revere it. You know, they will chop it up if they need to. And it's the same with Kafka and it's, it's the same all the way through his career. Cause he just, he just, just yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, treat Shakespeare as just a, a collaborator and I'm going to treat Kafka as just my script collaborator. And why the hell not? You know, they're just writers like anybody else. And he has sort of this thing that's both the audacity to do that and mm. the humility to uh, work with somebody else's material and, and shape it. <laughs> yeah, uh, oh like gosh. I said, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to watch this a few more times so I can uh, actually speak somewhat intelligently yeah, yeah, about yeah. this. I, I apologize, Lee. I knew once Jack was coming on this that it was gonna be Jack and me just gushing about this film. For <laughs> it's, 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 hey, Daniel, it's all right. Uh, you know, I've got enough humility, so I, I don't have to always do the heavy lifting on this podcast. Y- right? y- you also have final edit on this, so I imagine you're going to transform <laughs> this conversation into your own personal vision of what a review of F for Fake could be. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. This will be a podcast about the rise of fascism. That's it's what's going to well, be. Well, kind of every podcast is about that now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every every podcast in 2018 is kind of that, yes, no, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. So do we have any uh, final words on this, or uh, do we want to move on to the one piece of trivia I have on this? <laughs> you only have one piece of trivia on this? Yeah, there there was only actually there was only like a handful of things that we we pretty much covered most of what I what I found yeah. talking about it. So the only thing I would ask, and and I'll just ask this parenthetically to Jack now, it would be interesting if you had anything to say about the Chartres sequence because I think you might. I've kind of had my say on it, but that's that's kind of that would be the one thing that if we were going to do kind of one more little like five minute thing would be to just kind of get Jack's opinion of that. Yeah, I, I think I've kind of said it already, already really in, in other ways. But yeah, it's 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 gorgeous. It's very moving. And the, the point of it is he, he uh, the point of it is worn very much on the sleeve, I think, isn't it? It's that the point is the point is the result. The point is the beauty and the meaning of the result and, and how long it endures and what it means to people. And ultimately, that's got a lot less to do with, you know, anybody's name being stuck on it. And, any you know, the... Um, the glory or the credit going to any one person and of course something like the cathedral of Chartres, it's going to be an enormous collaborative enterprise it, it can't not be there, there might have been somebody who who was more responsible for designing it than than another but it's in the end it's one of the i mean wells sees it as this great achievement of civilization and it's an incredible collaboration. Maybe, maybe not what we would, you know, now think think of as an equal or or a democratic collaboration. Maybe there were problems with the circumstances, you know, from our modern point of view. But it's still it's still people working together and from from an you know an intense feeling of devotion and collaboration. And he's it's it. I think one of the things he sounds so moved when he talks about it. And of course, the the passion in his voice is completely fake. He's acting. Um, <laughs> But I'm unapologetically of the opinion that Wells was a brilliant actor, by the way. I don't hold with this oh, yeah, crap about no, him yeah. being a bad actor. I think he was a great actor. And he knows just when to overplay it. And he deliberately overplays it, I think, when he's talking there. It's sort of the last words of that sequence. He has this tremble of emotion in his voice. And it's so thick. It's it's laid on so thick, but it, it works. And that's sort of a motif for the film, isn't it? Because you need that level of fakery, that level of artifice to get the sincerity across. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing, sorry, one more, I said one more thing and now it's two more things. Um, I love in that final sequence where uh, a code and Wells wearing the, uh, the hats and the, uh, the suits, that's oh, they, just, oh, they're so know, cute together. They're so cute. <laughs> I love Kodar in the, in, you know, I love her undressed. I love her dress. She's just amazing. <laughs> She's, but I, you know, by some accounts, she's a bit of a cantankerous, awkward person. Although when that's, you know, when that's coming from people like Bogdanovich, how much credit do you give it? I, but, um, this, this is something was, I've kind of, this is something I said in the last episode, which you didn't uh, <laughs> note there, Jack, but, or you haven't listened to. I haven't listened uh, to it yet because I haven't, yeah, I haven't watched yeah. the film. When, yet, but... when uh, in a post-Me Too world, anytime that a, a woman on a movie set or a, uh, 
know, when that kind of negotiation is yeah. described as difficult. Yeah, I, I have a very low opinion of the veracity of that, you know. Yeah, so. no, I agree. And she was she was so good for him. I, I think his his last films, I think they're his greatest films, and they're shot through mm-hmm. with a new kind of humanity, I think. You know, it's not it's not just her. I don't want to sort of fall into the trap of, you know, thinking that she was his muse in that sort of old fashioned sense and that she softened him with her, you know, her femininity or any of that crap. But th- there was, there was obviously something in that relationship that, that was transformative for him because his last few films are so much more intimate and open and, you know, they're so much more sexual apart from anything else. And they're, right. they're so well, much more. She, she's a clear creative. It's not that she's his muse, that she's a creative partner in a way that is, you know, a collaborator. She's someone so who's he becomes, bringing as much as he is to this. Yeah. And he becomes it's just, the, the auteur he, he was always meant to be yeah. through this intense yeah. collaboration. Again, imagine, imagine if Kodar had been able to get funding for her own films post yeah. you know i who kodar might have had a, a brilliant uh directorial career had uh, the the sort of finances been around had, had the system not been so weighed against her for so long and sorry that's the other thing um no i, I was no, just gonna no. i was just gonna mention a, a more minor point uh just before we kind of wrap up here is that is the uh, the way that kodar delivering the sort of the quote unquote picasso lines versus uh wells doing mm you know, the, the way that that conversation plays out and where, um, you know, they kind of switch roles from time to time and yeah. even, uh, you know, just, it, and it's all completely understandable how it's put together. It's all completely understandable who's supposed to be speaking at any given time, despite the fact that, you know, really it's just two actors doing multiple roles, doing multiple perspectives over some long stretch of time. And the writing of that, the writing of this kind of fake Picasso, it has a level of verisimilitude. It has a level of uh, reality. Like you can imagine that little sequence being its own little short film and being lauded just on its own, you know, kind of merits. Again, it's it's just fucking miraculous. I'm I'm gushing now, but it's it is. It's so layered and it's so complicated what's going on this back and forth yeah. game. Uh, and yet it's so cogent and fluid and comprehensible. And it's got all these implications that just come at you thick and fast, and yet you catch them all as they come. And then you catch the shifts in the not not only the shifts in the sort of power play between the two characters, Kodar and Wells are playing, but also the the, the minor shifts in the relationship between Kodar and Wells as they play these characters talking to each other. Oh. It's it's so brilliant. <laughs> it's just it's oh. just one of the greatest things anybody's ever done. <laughs> I love this film so much. Oh God! Talking about this film, I re- literally re- rewatched this like two hours ago. Yeah. I now want to sit down and watch it again. That yeah, that's I want I want I want you and I to sit down and do a, a commentary now. <laughs> Let, let's do it right now. I'm down. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I just want to say one other thing, which is that I love this sort of the 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 debauched sort of atmosphere of. 70s party life yes. in this film. I, I love this it's everybody just dropping into each other's houses and in and out of restaurants and everybody's smoking and the, the air's thick with cigarette smoke and everybody's oh, boozing yeah. and everybody's eating and you know everybody's wearing gigantic floppy bow ties and just shit talking in, in in these wonderful 70s parties it's just you get this sense of this this gang of people that just go from party to restaurant to party to restaurant constantly yeah. in this in this in, fog in of yet, champagne and yeah. cigar smoke <laughs> <laughs> and, yet, and yet Wells is still polite to the waiter, which is, you know, yeah. one of those like Yeah. He he directly looks at people when he talks to them. He gives he gives them that respect, you know, whereas any other person might not look at the waiter. They might just be kind of dismissive, even if they say a thank you. But every everything he every time he says like a thank you or whatever, he, he's looking r- right in your eyes and he's he's mean he's makes it he may he makes it mean something instead of just being flippant. You, you just get this sense with Wells that he loves people. He, he loves mm. himself very, very much, but he loves he loves everybody else too. He, he just loves human beings. Yeah, he's just enraptured I, to be surrounded by people. You see the camera following uh, uh, Elmer around around uh, Abiza, and he. By the way, he's wearing this like almost like Conan the Barbarian fucking belt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, 
<laughs> and he's, he's it's like he apparently he knows everybody on the island so he he's just walking around i want you to come to my party saturday you know it's like but he, come to my party saturday at o'clock and you, so then everyone's at his house and there's endless wine all around even though dehore was basically almost in poverty because he he didn't really make all that much money off his forgeries as opposed no, to the art dealers he he was he was bilked out of all the uh, proceeds from his crimes that should have mm. gone to him. You know, <laughs> he's living basically on the you know in that house that he didn't own because mm. one of the dealers that you know used him basically as a forgery factory and then took all the money. Just uh, yeah. he he had also just recently, and this is obliquely mentioned a couple of times in the film, but never you know he had a uh, very recently gotten out of prison for yeah. uh, homosexual behavior. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Then he, yeah, and, and he killed himself two years later. Yeah, I know he died in seventy six. So uh, I hope we got to see the film. Honestly, I imagine he did. It's yeah. not. It's not like the other side of the wind, where <laughs> two thirds of the cast have all died and they never got to see it. Yeah. So the only other interesting piece of trivia here that we didn't really cover: um, Wells filmed a trailer for this that lasted nine minutes and featured several shots of a uh, topless uh, uh, Oya Kodar, and the trailer was rejected by U.S. distributors. Apparently, it had all kinds of footage that was not in the film at all. It was that, you know how, um, that trailer is on YouTube, and it's on the uh, the Criterion disc, if you want to watch it. It is. Uh, the, the guy in um, F for Fake who plays the... Um, uh, news reporter. It's actually Gary Graver, who's uh, mm. Wells' director of photography at this point, and, and his sort of collaborator and factotum for the last 15 years of his life. And he's got a much bigger role in the trailer, funnily enough, playing <laughs> a sort of presenter of a of a TV documentary. And it's very, the, the trailer is very Python-esque. I, I was remembered of, uh, reminded of like Eric Idle pretending to be a documentary presenter <laughs> in, the, uh, in the trailer. <laughs> Yeah, you get hints of that in the film too when you do see the little little cuts to to that sort of mock documentary thing that he's doing where yeah. eventually it breaks down to the point where yeah, this is bullshit. <laughs> 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 um yeah, so do, I do have box office from France for this, uh 182,857 francs, I assume. <laughs> uh according to Wikipedia, that's admissions. But, admissions you know, oh okay yeah yeah, yeah. so who, who knows how this did i don't imagine it probably did all that well because it, it was critically panned in the u.s for the most part take it most people just didn't understand it back then so but you gotta think in 73 like what this would have played like what a handful of like art theaters this would, yeah you know this would this would have been for like wells completest only in like a handful of like major cities Mm-hmm. And uh, people would have seen it. Basically, these are like really wealthy New York Times subscribers, and like fuck those people, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> it would have been like a conversation have... piece for like two minutes, where oh yeah, I don't get this at all because it's not you know it, it's not pretending to be a film noir in 1973, and therefore it's, bad. it's like like you could have made this make money right if if you get you, you do the distribution properly you get the word of mouth out there you you get a, you advertise it in the right way this is Orson Welles he made the greatest movie ever made the critics in France love it it's a masterpiece you need to see this you know if you're if you're a smart artistic person this is the thing to see you could well, make you, this make you, money you, the will you, just wasn't there you you played in the like underground and even in 73 there would have been like kind of the like the hippie theaters you know played yeah. it you play it to the counterculture the counterculture should have embraced imagine if this had like gotten out there and the counterculture had embraced it early like we might have gotten this kind of really interesting kind of underground like you know remix culture uh, with films uh, among the hippies like we could have overted the entire rest of the 20th century you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he does he does basically create an entire new genre of cinema in this film he, he creates i mean he he himself didn't call it a, a, a film essay but and it, and i suppose it is it's not a documentary exactly it's not an essay exactly but it's it's something you know and whatever it is it's very new and it deserved the opportunity to catch on with people. And the will just, Wells always said that they could have made Citizen Kane work if they just take it and show it in tents around the country and market it as the film that the rich and powerful guys that run newspapers don't want you to see, you know? Yeah. And 
of course, the rich and powerful guys that run newspapers are also the rich and powerful guys that run studios, and that's the whole yeah. thing about behind Kane and all that. And he was right. And the, you know, again, it, it proves his thesis, doesn't it, that the art is completely hostage to this world of commercialism, and the world of commercialism didn't want anything to do with this because it was a bit too close to home. And right. the uh, the experts, the know nothing experts in the middle, the art critics, the cinema critics, Pauline Kale, you know, oh. all these people, his arch enemy, they duly took their cue and said, "Oh no, it's not worth bothering with. Don't watch it." So in a way, it's you know, it's failure. It was very disappointing to him. He he saw himself as having created something very new with this movie, and he wanted to keep on making movies like this. He saw this as the first of a series. Tragically, that never happened. But in a way, it's failure is. It, you know, in yet another wonderful metafictional twist that's completely apt, the failure of this film completely proves its point. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like Pauline Kael became a uh, character of the other side of the wind. Not no, that I'm trying not to at convince all. you. <laughs> not that I'm trying to convince you to see the other side of the wind as soon as possible, Jack. I'm, I'm but, going to. I just, you know, I, I, I'm, the conditions need to be right. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah, so uh, saving it for the for the right moment. So DVD this is details. big. This is big. This is big for me. Oh, yeah. I, as I said in the last episode, I literally have been waiting twenty years to see the other side of the wind, and yeah. uh, it lives up to it. 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 Okay, we'll leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. DVD. Tell, t- tell us about the DVD. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the DVD <laughs> details for this film are as follows. Um. Two Criterion Collection releases from 2005 and 2014, and that's basically it. There's no Blu-rays or anything like that, as far as I can tell. So, not, not that you really need it. You don't really need a Blu-ray of this. But um, I have the 2005 Criterion. Yeah. So there you go. Um, so, Daniel, what are we doing next episode? Well, we're going to continue on this heady, heady headspace of. Uh, art films that deeply uh, question the nature of the medium of film itself. And we're going to like dip our toes into the au revoir, um, if you will, of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be taking a look at his 1985 film Commando, which had about as a big an impact on me when I saw it, when I was <laughs> like seven or eight years old as F for fake head on our friend Jack here. And the Running Man, which uh, probably also equal, yeah, no, uh, about the, about the same. So uh, yeah, we're gonna deep, we're gonna do a deep dive on my childhood and look at um, you know big pectoral muscles uh, for the next episode, which will be equally intellectual. I guarantee you, if you like this episode. So yes, is, and, uh... is, it, is it definitely called Commando, or is it about commandos, or C for Commando, or it, it is it is it is titled Commando? Yes. Right, okay. Yeah, <laughs> C for Commando. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, and we're going to have uh, a potentially a special guest on, on that episode as well, which will probably uh, lower, the, uh, <laughs> lower the, the standards even more, and he'll be proud to do that, by the way. Uh, so I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not... I, I, I think, I, think I, I, will, I speak for myself. Jack, if you want to come back and talk about Commando and the Running Man, you're welcome back alongside our other guest. I think it would be an amazing experience. But, yes, um... <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for being on, Jack. It's, it's always nice to, to have you on the podcast. Please tell people where they can find your stuff and uh, what you've been up to lately. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for having me back on it's always lovely to be on uh Tumbados. it's one of my favorite podcasts uh, thank you for tolerating me for this long um you and you, you and like 15 others that's it yeah, yeah. yeah you can find me by googling the phrase shibugan graffiti with one o and uh and or going to my twitter which is jack uh hang on a minute uh, underscore <laughs> jack underscore underscore, gram, underscore underscore thank you just yeah just co- I tell you what, contact Daniel and he'll tell you what where to go if you want to find my stuff. That's the yes. right thing to do. That's, That's the right. best way. And my Twitter is at Daniel Lee Harper, which you, so just message me or just look to who I've been retweeting lately and you'll find Jack. I, I, I guarantee you. <laughs> and lots of Nazis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> lots of Nazi bullshit, which uh, we didn't mention in this episode until just now. So thanks, Jack. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, we did talk about the rise of fascism a little bit, 
so you know slightly, um yeah. yeah slightly so you can find this podcast at tmbdos.podbean.com where you can find all of our other episodes all of our re- requisite links to apple podcasts youtube facebook join the facebook group they must be destroyed on site on facebook and you'll find out what's coming up on the podcast and you can interact with us and tell us how great we are or how utter shit we are uh either way we we we, we welcome both things and um yeah, until next time, we'll be back with some uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Cheers. You've been listening to They Must Be Destroyed on Site. For other episodes, our Apple Podcast, YouTube, and Facebook group links, as well as podcasts and websites of similar interest, please visit us at tmbdos.podbean.com. Thank you. Drive through.